Now coming now to my father, Bedra Sevajan, I will give a brief uh, outline of his background and early life before I uh, move on to his work. So Bedra Sevajan was born on 18th May 1918 uh, to Avedis and the Iranic Sevajan, who were both Armenians from Aintab in the Ottoman Empire. Bedros grew up in Addis Ababa. He was educated at the Araratian Armenian Primary School and the Tafari Makonnen Secondary School, where he met many of his lasting Ethiopian friends, many of whom were of the aristocracy. Bedros had quite a mixed and eclectic education. He had excellent mathematics and engineering skills. He had excellent language skills. He spoke perfect Amharic, they always said like a noble, and was fluent in Armenian, spoken and written. He also had fluent Italian, Turkish, and he spoke passable French and English. Bedros lived and worked all his adult life in Ethiopia. And unlike most other Armenians in Ethiopia at the time, he was an Ethiopian national and this was by gift of Empress Menon. By 1936, the young Bedros had already decided that he could not join his father's businesses, unlike his brothers, and he apprenticed himself to Nigoros Jidejan, one of the greatest Armenian goldsmiths in Ethiopia, who had made the coronation crown for Empress Menon in 1930. And incidentally, the crown of His Majesty was also made by an Armenian called Hagop Bardasarian. But Jidejan made the Empress's one. So Bedros chose Jidejan because he was more modern in his work. And Jidejan encouraged him to develop his own style and to work in silver, which became Bedros's speciality. In 1938, Bedros left to study silversmithing and jewelry in Milan, Italy. There he also learned metallurgy and how to work with precious stones. This is one of the major ways in which he differed from other Armenian jewelers in Addis Ababa at the time. As far as I know, the only other contemporary Armenian artisan who was European trained was the watchmaker Antranik uh, Kanadjan, who was trained in Switzerland. Upon his return from Milan, Bedros resumed work with Jidejan, from whom he eventually bought the business and workshop. <clears throat> and the business known as Bedros A. Sevajian was established in 1946. <coughs> At that point, Bedros had decided to pursue more than decorative work he was able to fulfill some large governmental contracts. He built a new and large workshop in the extensive compound of the Sevajan family home. The area very soon became known as Saratan Yasafar, which is workers' district in Arada, which it still is, because of the workshop and the number of people which were, who were employed by him. On 16th February, 1950, his Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie I, Emperor of Ethiopia, was pleased to designate Bedros Esevajan as furnisher to the Imperial Palace, thus making Bedros a holder of the <coughs> Imperial Warrant. And here it must be said that although there were a great many uh, goldsmiths and silversmiths in Ethiopia, Ethiopians, uh, Armenians, Italians, Arabs, uh, Greeks and Indians, many of whom worked directly from the palace, Bedros was the only holder of the imperial warrant, which he held until the end of empire in 1974. Also, his business differed from the other Armenian jewelers in Addis in that it was the only one of its kind to be carried out on an industrial scale. One of the largest and most impressive of his works from his early days is the silver and gold epen and tray, which His Majesty presented to President Tito of Yugoslavia in 1954. 
It is on display at the National Museum of Yugoslavia in Belgrade. Which is a thing of beauty, I think. <clears throat> As his business grew, Bedros was able to start making different items for the imperial government. Most importantly, in November 1952, he won a permanent concession for producing all badges, buttons, stars, and so on for the armed forces and police. Soon after, he was appointed to produce all medals and orders to be given to civilian and um, military awardees. So I'll show you some of these things. Um, here we have uh, the colors. One on the end is the Order of Solomon's Cross collar. The one in the middle is the Queen of Sheba collar and badge. And the end one is a collar of Queen of Sheba. The little round things in the, in, there are the rosettes that one wears in the lapel when you're not wearing the full, the full things. This is a collar and sash order of the Queen of Sheba. Some of these pictures are more than 60 years old, so. This lovely thing is the Order of the Star of Ethiopia Grand Cross. You might have seen that the Crown Council just awarded some people these in uh, Washington, D.C. This is the Collar and Breast Badge Grand Cross Order of Solomon Seal which was uh, usually awarded to foreign dignitaries. And here is the collar breast badge order of the Queen of Sheba again. Before then, <coughs> these intricate items, including the ribbons and the boxes, which he made, um, the presentation boxes, had been contracted to famous French and British manufacturers. For example, Artus Bertrand of Paris, Mapino and Webb of London, and Spink of London, among mm -hmm. others. So by now, Bedros had also become assayer of pre precious uh, metals and gemstones for the Treasury and for the National Bank of Ethiopia. To produce all this, Bedros employed a great many skilled workers. Most were Ethiopian, though his master engraver and jeweler was Italian. When necessary, he employed or subcontracted to other jewelers. His favorite subcontractors were Cabrier de Genet, you might have heard of, and Takludesta, both young Ethiopian craftsmen who were trained by Ethiopians. And the Nalbandian brothers, Hrant and Pizant, whose work came up to his exacting standards, as well as Girard Mekjan, who he considered a great technician. The factory employed at least 30 full-time staff, and the numbers doubled during times when uh, special contracts were fulfilled. In 1955, Bedros made a huge investment and imported big presses and other machinery from the UK and U uh, Czechoslovakia. Repeaters and engravers were from Italy. The workshop became a factory. Its work achieved outstandingly ha uh, sharp reliefs and clarity of design. No one else at that time in Addis was able to replicate his work. All the while, he was also making jewelry and objects for sale in his showrooms. Bedros was one of the first to stylize Ethiopian crosses from different regions, now gener generically known as Lalibela crosses, to be worn as jewelry. Here we have a set of six uh, in silver. <coughs> They're all 830 pur purity silver. This is the one I'm wearing. You can see it later. This is a gold one, 18 karat gold. <coughs> and then there were all these other things that were made for the showrooms. Uh, basically for the tourist trade. Most people who went to Addis would go and buy a little something. 
this is a coaster, uh, a silver coaster with the Maria <coughs> Teresa Center. And amazingly, this particular item was found by a friend of my sister Janine at Yerevan Vernissage. And she bought it for her and brought it back. Um, here we have a very 1960s looking mat hold, um, matchbox holder and um, ashtray. And a match hold, uh, matchbox holder and a tea strainer. Rather nice. At the same time, <coughs> Bedros built up a portfolio of agencies of luxury goods. For example, Mappen and Webb again. Asprey, who actually held an exhibition in his showrooms in Addis Ababa in 1955. Saint Louis, Baccarat, Limoges, Wedgwood, uh, and so on. And this gentleman was Mr. Hubbard of Aspreys, who came all the way to Addis Ababa and brought lots of Aspreys stuff. Now, two of, his, uh, of Pedros's most famous works, and of his works from the 1960s, is um, 1963, he made this silver wreath which His Majesty laid at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. And I was delighted to locate this in the Memorial Parks Museum in D.C., where it is kept in storage. It was a little bit damaged, but the curators were very happy to bring it out, and they restored it so that we could have a little reception to see it. And His Imperial Highness Prince Hermes, Salah uh, Selassie, Haile Selassie, graced the occasion which was uh, very, very emotional. Um, this is the silver content, which is eight, 813 the thousand silver. Um, this object was made by melting down 580 Maria Teresa Talas. It is about 75 centimeters tall and weighs nearly 14 kilograms. The two long stems of Tsugereda roses, Rosa abyssinica, are held tight together at the base where there is an inscription in Amharic and English. It's Prince Hermias doing, making his speech. That is the de detail of the um, Finil. This is a picture of my dear friend Solomon Cabrier, who is the son of Cabrier de Gene, who, was, who also came to the thing. And here we have a little indulgence uh, because we have uh, on the end Lijabi Abi, who is the son of General Abi Abebe, and my cousin Ada. Silpa, Prince Hermias, my sister Janine, me, my brother Philip, my sister Anais, and Solomon Cabrier on the end. Then the next thing with the real wow factor, of course, is the gold tray, which was presented to Her Majesty the Queen <coughs> in 1965, and which was exhibited at Buckingham Palace in July and August uh, 2017, which was a great and unexpected uh, honor. This tray, by the way, is not nine carats gold or 10 or 12 or what's the next one, 18 or 20. Mm -hmm. It's 22 carats gold, 22 carat gold. It measures 80 centimeters by 51 and a half and it's half a centimeter thick and it weighs 14 kilograms. <laughs> so, the size of a toddler. <laughs> so you can't, you can't present your tea on it. <laughs> it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Um, very stylized, of course. And it's got the, uh, the crown of Ethiopia on one side and the crown of England on the other. 
So that, is, that made us very proud and we were very happy to go and see it, Buckingham Palace. Both Pedros and his wife, uh, Zovinar, were active members of the Armenian community. Pedros made meaningful donations in the form of artifacts made in, in his factory. In 1958, he donated the silver Vartabets Kavazan, which is actually a church item only to be used by a doctor of the church, not, not a married priest. It's got to be a celibate priest, uh, which, which is still kept at uh, St. George's Armenian Church in, in Addis Ababa. Very stylized, ruby eyes, golden um, tongue, for tongue, and the scales, of course, a silver item. Uh, and in 1965, he made and donated gold commemorative medal for the 50th anniversary of the Armenian genocide. Um, these medals would have been sold uh, and the proceeds used for the upkeep of the church, the school, and any needy people in the, in the community. So that's the uh, obverse and the reverse. And some other pictures that I would like to share with you to, so that you can see what else he, he did. This splendid gentleman is the Catholicos uh, Joren I of the Great House of Silesia. And he is wearing the badge, um, the badge and sash of the cr Grand Cross Star of the Order of the Queen of Sheba which was awarded to him when he came to Addis Ababa in 1965 for the Great Ec Ec Ecumenical Council uh, of Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox churches. And then last year, I was delighted to be given a private tour of the private apartments in Nicosia, Cyprus, of the late Archbishop, Archbishop Makarios III, where I was able to photograph his order of the Queen of Sheba, which was awarded to him in 1973. And because the apartments are always kept in semi-darkness, the, the ribbon ha and sash has stayed absolutely crisp and clear. The colors are really lovely. And here we have uh, a picture of my mother. And she's wearing the costume of an Armenian lady from the fifth century BC. She's wearing um, bracelets these bracelets, and the torque, the, the shoulder pins, and the diadem, which were all made for the occasion by Bedros. They're not all real, real gold or anything. They were made for the, for the occasion. And the occasion was the Red Cross Fair of 1962, when she presented His Majesty with a bouquet of flowers to welcome him to the <coughs> Armenian stand. And you might see it better there. This lady was Mrs. Bablanyan. She was the director of uh, the Empress's uh, needlework school. And I think she made, she made the hat and various bits and pieces. Bedros also made a great many commemorative medals, of which I don't have many pictures. But anyway, this is one which is the inauguration of the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia in 1965. And these were in gold, silver, or bronze. And the reverse. And here we have the full set of, for the 10th anniversary of the founding of Organization African Unity in 1974. So it's one of his last works. And my own favorite is the cap badge for a game warden, which is quite an early one, I would think. I'll show you a few pictures of very highly stylized jewelry, like this uh, star ruby with pearl ring with this crenellation and things. It looks very Byzantine to, to, to me. And of course, the famous cufflinks that he was famous for. And everybody now makes them. And I think if you go to Takludesta, you will find them. But you won't find them as heavy as uh, Pedro's were. 18 karat gold with obsidian. 
Um, a couple of things which I know exist somewhere. I don't know where they are. I haven't found them yet. I might be able to find them in Addis. They should be in Ethiopia. One is this gold frame with the young Rastafari as regent. Um, I think this was made in maybe 1966 or so. And you can see that it's got um, stylized coffee beans and coffee leaves because the frame was a gift from um, Kafa pro province. So th this item, it must be there somewhere. I would love to see it. And the other one is actually, this is a, a picture of an actual commission to make this item. And it would have been a <coughs> gift to his majesty from the armed forces. And again, lots of gold and silver and whatever. This must be there somewhere as well. So Bedros designed most of the <coughs> objects and commemorative medals himself. And I think you will all agree that they are works of an artist. Um, the orders had been in circulation long before um, he started. So they were designed by probably European designers. Uh, but his factory then carried on making them. This is a picture of Bedros making a presentation to His Majesty on the occasion of his 80th birthday in 1972, one of the very last pictures of the two together. Tragically, all this came to an end with the revolution of 1974. The business and factory were closed down, confiscated, looted, so that hardly any records exist. The great machinery was dismantled for whatever reason, and then left in a heap. The precious dyes were cast aside and then sold as scrap metal. And finished and unfinished artifacts have found their way into the streets of, uh, street markets of Addis Ababa, and some can now be found on eBay. You can buy them on eBay. Actually, any day of the week, you can look on eBay and there's something by him. So there is very little written about my father and his work, but a gentleman called Burhanu Simu had a section on him in his book, which was called Yeazrar, Design and Na Fashion by Ethiopia. <laughs> the Design and Fashion of Buttons in Ethiopia, which was published in 2014. Today in Addis Ababa, the name Bedro Sevajan lives on at Saratanya Sefer, where many of the descendants of his workforce still live. He has a great presence on the internet. He has his own Facebook page if you want to uh, check it out. And thanks to the interest taken in him by Rastafarians and those who recognize his unique work, I am discovering more and more about the work my father did I give special thanks to Bertrand Duquesnois, who brought all this to my attention a few years ago, and collectors such as Gad Ambessa, Ali Jackson, Jim Marshall, and Adam Simeon, who have been so generous with their praise of my father and for sharing their knowledge of his work. And they have shown so much love for my father and his work and by extension to my family. And I thank them from the bottom of my heart. And um, basically that is the end of my talk. And thank you very much for listening. And I will try to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take a seat. Thank you, yes, absolutely. <laughs>
Yes, as I said, <clears throat> a lot of the ones who came before 1915 came on their own. A lot of the men who came in before 1915 and they married uh, local women. The, I can, from the top of my head, I can think of at least four families. And the Borosians that I talked about, Krikoros, they were definitely uh, intermarried. After 1915, as I explained, they had a lot of women uh, who were left as orphans and things. They brought them with them and they, they married like that. But yes, a lot of them did intermarry. Some went to, to university there, I believe, but not, not all that many, I don't think. Okay. Maybe. Thank you very much. I very much enjoyed it. My apologies for my Please. Uh, <coughs> I'm very pleased that you show the picture of the order of the Seal of Solomon. Uh -huh. Because in my research, I found the, the person who designed Oh, really? I'd be very pleased to know. A German artist called Eduard Sander in 1866. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. On the commission of Theodoros. Uh, we know that he worked on it in April 1866. <coughs> we, I have a design, the picture of the design, but I don't know what happened. Whether it actually was put into practice and, you know, made. And there were three little uh, classes going similarly. Yes, yes. And so. there were the enameled ones as well. Yeah. Which were very beautiful. For foreign, for foreign yes. And also for Ethiopian uh, award holders. So it was. Yes. The design goes back to <coughs> Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask you again for the name of. <laughs> um, my concern is. We have developed Ethiopians the habit of disregarding what has happened before 1974. So, mm. I mean, people like me, I was very lucky. My father was a great storyteller, and he's to tell he knew, he interacted with these people, and uh, I knew about them. So, how are we going to honor these people and also make sure that uh, their stories are told? Um, and the next generation of Ethiopians know that Ethiopia didn't just appear <laughs> overnight like the way we find them no. now. And uh, we, we, we developed the habit of, you know, um, rewarding, appreciating what other people have done. Uh, for example, this such that I'm wearing now, mm. they were produced by the Kodarian. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was also a great man called Yakov who a shoemaker, I don't know if you knew him in Central Addis. He, he was quite elderly and he died. Um, uh, Recently? He was there in, yeah. No, don't know you. And he was married to an Ethiopian lady as well. But for me, the most important thing is about paying tribute to all who have contributed to Ethiopia. And how are we going to do this? Then, um, I was heartbroken recent, in recent years when we went past uh, the Armenian club and the restaurant. It doesn't function anymore, you know, and it is so sad. Um, we, we went and we were told, I think once, one I, evening a week, yes. they, they opened. Yes. And <clears throat> to lose all that was very sad to me. The area itself, um, the neighborhood. Well, there are so few. And as you say, it is true that young people in Ethiopia just don't know what an Armenian is, let alone who they were or whatever. It is an uphill thing. But I have to say that the new prime minister did, did make a speech fairly recently and said that uh, these people mustn't be forgotten. So something has started. He mentioned Armenians by name and also Greeks and Italians and all the others. So, for my part, I do what I can. I write articles. I have, you know, with the Facebook and Facebook, of course, everybody is very derisory about Facebook. But without Facebook, I couldn't have done this. Um, and I'm searching. Um, the problem with us is that there were only 1,200 to start with, as I said. And now we are scattered all over the world. Believe me, I mean, there's one in <laughs> It's almost impossible to find them all. Um, but 
everyone, every Ethio-Armenian Ethio still carries Ethiopia in their heart and they always talk about it and they all eat wet and they all, you know, all these things. And they try very hard to go back to talk, but it is, you know, a few hundred people. Um, I was a little bit disappointed when we had that, um, the reception for the, the wreath in Washington, D.C. And uh, we got in touch with uh, Tadias magazine and all those. Of course, Prince Hermias came, which was, which was great. But the, the, the magazines in, in Washington were, and you know, there are lots of... It's a bit political, I know what you're saying. Huh? <laughs> it gets a bit political. That's what well, I, if we put the but I mean, I can't, I can't involve myself in that kind yeah, of politics. Just, you know, but they wouldn't even write two, two, two lines about it. Mm, yeah, exactly. So, but, there are but we have to try. So yes, okay. we have to try. Go on. We have until nine o'clock, I think, don't we? The first one is how long is the relation between the Armenian and the Greek and Italian communities in the third Oh, very good, I think. We, we all had a sporting club. There was the Armenian one was called Ararat, the Greek one was called Olympias, Olympic. Olympic or Olympias, or, and Juventus was the Italian one. And of course, they had all, and all the different schools, and they had football matches and uh, you know, all that sort of thing, uh, bicycling and whatever. So the, yes, it was. Second question, sorry, and what about current relations? Sorry? What about current relations between Armenia and Ethiopia right now? Well, Armenia and Ethiopia, I can't, I can't imagine there is a huge amount of relations going on. I don't know. You know, Armenia is a tiny little place. Ethiopia has so many problems. But I can tell you that in those days, Armenians and Ethiopians were like, I don't know, certainly brothers, let's say, or whatever. But, uh, and wherever we go, I mean, for example, my, my sisters and I were in uh, the United States and the first thing we do is look for an Ethiopian restaurant, and we go and talk. Uh, oh God, it's in us. It's it's in our blood, really. Okay, so. Elizabeth, and I was wondering where they went in 1974 <coughs> when the community was scattered. They couldn't presumably go back to Armenia to Turkey. To well, there was no Armenia from. in those days. Uh, it was a go? Soviet. Well. In a way, they were quite lucky. Some of them, in those days, there was, um, what was it called? There was an immigration um, program by the Canad Canadians and also the Australians. And quite a few went to Canada and Australia. Others were already out, I mean, uh, either because of schooling or whatever, and we stayed out. Uh, and wherever they could, really. Some of them went off and tried to make a go of it in, uh, I don't know, Lebanon, places like that. Didn't succeed, then ended up in Canada. Uh, there are quite a lot in um, California, for example. Um, so I think they, they did have a difficult, a difficult time. Some of them, of course, used to work for uh, government agencies and they suddenly found themselves with no job, with children, with this, that, and the other, and they were basically, their homes were confiscated, not just their, their work. And they had to get up and go wherever they could, and whatever they could do. So they did have a hard time, I think. But they still love Ethiopia. <laughs> Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by the extent of the uh, Armenian contribution to the economic and cultural life of the country at the critical juncture in its history. Uh, my early encounter with an Armenian was in the northern Ethiopian city, uh, at the Kiria. We, we all thought was the Greek <laughs> then. Uh, and later on, my sister married to uh, an Armenian, Hanko Bogosian. Uh, uh, yes. Your presentation makes an excellent outline, 
do you plan to publish something? Mm. Uh, alternatively, how can your uh, excellent presentation be, be made more accessible to a wider audience? And well, I am planning to write something eventually, but I'm still, I'm still collating. Um, I'm still finding uh, descendants of these people and trying to get them to give me information. Some of them don't, la don't, don't really, they're not really interested. A lot, like the Borosians, uh, the Karajans, they really want to put their story across. So I have to put, uh, talk to a lot more people. In the case of my father's work, I have to actually go and see a lot more of his work and identify as his because although he signed most of his work, not everything is signed, but I can recognize more or less what was his and what wasn't. So I have to do a lot of traveling and I have to do a lot of talking and eventually I would like to publish something for my father, uh, you know, with pictures and, and something about the Armenians of Ethiopia because there's very little actually written by them uh, which is accessible, not too heavily um, academic or whatever. So we'll see. Watch this space. <laughs> Anyone else? I would like to know if you have met personally His Majesty. Yes. And if so, if you would like to share something with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I have. I met him twice, but I was very young at the time, okay? Because I'm quite an old lady now. But um, the first time, I think I was about. 10, maybe 12, and he came to, actually, no, that's not true. I met Her Majesty, Empress Menon, asked to see me when I was a baby of six months. Apparently, she really liked babies, and she asked my father when she heard that, she, she, she really liked my father, as I said, and when she heard that they had had a new baby, she said, okay, when, when, he, you know, when he stops screaming or whatever, bring it, and I would like to see it. So I was taken and introduced to Her Majesty. So that was when I was six months old. <clears throat> After that, I, I, th I personally met His Majesty when I was about 10. I was at my uncle's farm in Bishoftu. And His Majesty has this habit of just dropping in to have a look. And um, I don't know what I was doing. I was behind a hedge or something. And I ran out. And there he was <laughs> in front of me. And of course, um, I was all in my shorts and probably barefoot or something. And uh, my, my father introduced me. And I remember, I remember he was about the same height as me because I was quite, t I was quite tall for my thing. But of course, having to bow down and kiss his hand and everything, I remember thinking, he's a giant. <laughs> so, big. so that was the first one. And then another time, uh, we, my father also had a house in Bishoftu, which was, had an orchard. Uh, and His Majesty enjoyed fruit. He loved fresh fruit. And whenever the first fruits arrived, boxes of fruit were sent to His Majesty. And one morning, everybody, there, there were runners. And they came and they started knocking on our uh, shutters. Jan hoimata, jan hoimata. So we all get, got out of bed. I think it was half past five in the morning. It was just getting light. And we rushed out, got dressed, rushed out, just in time as he arrived with his full entourage. <laughs> and we, of course, we had to line up and say hello. And my younger sister, Anais, was very uh, lucky that day to be the recipient of a gold sovereign from him, one of his sovereigns. So those, were, those are my memories of him, really. And I received my Ethiopian skill living certificate diploma from him as well. <laughs> and he asked me whose daughter I was. I remember that very well. He said, are you Bedros's or Kevork's? I said, Bedros. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> yeah. Same. Yes. So growing up, did you know that you were a privilege or did you know that your father was important? Huh. It's a difficult thing to ask because the whole family, in a way, was privileged. Because his older brother was also, he was making things for, the, for Asko. Uh, the other older brother had the flour mill. My father, I suppose, was the one who was at the Gibi more, more often than uh, anyone else. 
but privilege, privilege. I knew he was important, let's, say, let's put it this way. I knew he was different from the other jewelers, yeah. uh, the other Armenian jewelers, for example. Yeah, because every now and again, he would disappear for about two weeks because he would sleep at the factory. They were building these things, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was very exciting. Um, now, the last two questions, then, please. My name is Jeffrey. Who was it? Could you say a few words, if there's any words to say, about the relationship of the Armenian community's diaspora nowadays with independent Armenia um, sort of homeland? Are there connections? Do people go there? Oh, everybody tries to go. It's like a bit of a pilgrimage, but not many of us stay, I have to say. That's all I will say. <laughs> there is. Uh, the diaspora uh, tries to uphold the Ar Ar Armenian. Well, we call it homeland. The thing is that we are not from there. We all came from Asia Minor. We all came from the Ottoman Empire. And um, Armenia was born from so much strife, and late, latterly of, from the Soviet years, of course that they need a lot of upholding, they need a lot of financing. So we all do our bit and we, we all try and go uh, and see what it's all about. But I don't think many of us actually would go and live there. I don't know, I speak for myself, really. <laughs> okay, Lenny, last question. Yeah. You mentioned Asko. Yes. Asko is not very far from Addis Ababa. Well, what it, was Asko like? Because I have my annual base in Asko, and I would like to find out what did Asko look like in the days when you were there? Asko, it was, um, there was a tannery. What, I'm just going to tell you what I remember, because I mean, this is a long time ago. Firstly, the, the part of Gofersa where Asko was, it was, in those days, it was like going off into the countryside. Now it's part of... The altitude is, by the way, 2,650 That much and more. And the reason that my grandfather chose that area was because he grew mimosa trees for the tannery. So he had acres and acres of mimosa plantations. And in those days, it was just countryside. Now I think it's attached to Addis, oh, yes, and yes, it's, yes. it's as. And uh, I remember very well going, and it was beautiful, leafy, and there was a valley with a gorgeous river, and the tannery was down there, and you could smell it from miles away. Uh, beautiful flowers. There was uh, quite a nice house there, I remember. And the uh, shoe factory was quite modern. It was built in the, uh, they refurbished it and modernized it in the late 1960s, uh, 1970, I think. Asko has still a traction because there are huge, huge areas with eucalyptus trees. With? Eucalyptus trees. Yes. And also a few rivers. Yes, yes. Against the backdrop of mountains. Yes. It's very, very, the air it is beautiful. But uh, I remember some people bought up the mimosa plantations and they immediately cut it down. So, yes, thank you. yes, thank you. 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 Yes, I will. I'll be uh, probably putting it on my own YouTube uh, channel, and I will give you the, the link and everything. Of course, yes. Yeah, whatever. And it will also be on my father's Facebook page, which is Pedro Savaja and his life and work. <laughs> Yeah.